Welcome to the Wisconsin chapter of the Wildlife Society's fifth brown bag webinar. This web series was started in January by the chapter's membership committee consisting of myself, Jennifer Summers, Jenna Malinowski, and Brian Haringa. Um, this is something we put together that we want, we wanted something by our members for our members, um, but these events are open to the public and we want to let everybody know that may not already be a member of the Wildlife Society. It's only $20 per year. And with that $20, you'll be provided with networking and training opportunities, as well as the quarterly intelligent tinkering, which will be coming out very soon, um, and invitation to the annual winter meeting of the wildlife professionals in the state. So today for our brown bag web series, we have Elena Garretts and Lisa Kardash talking about Wisconsin Greater Prairie Chicken Management. We're gonna start off today with Lisa Kardash, who's a wildlife biologist for the Wisconsin DNR and has been in this role for 15 years. Um, she's primarily located out of Wisconsin Rapids area and has had a large focus on grassland management. She has her bachelor's and master's in wildlife ecology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today, she'll give an overview of the habitat management practices utilized by the Buena Vista Leola, George W. Mead, and Paul J. Olson wildlife areas where greater prairie chickens reside in central Wisconsin, including successes and challenges. All right, take it away, Lisa. Okay, does everyone see the screen just fine? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Are good to go. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it's great to see the, the great number of people I'm jumping on this call. So. Yeah, um, you know, perfect timing here. We just wrapped up doing our prairie chicken surveys for the year. Um, it was great to be out and there's a lot going on in the prairie chicken world. So this is a really good opportunity to, to give everyone some updates on the management that we've been up to and, and later to hear from Elena. So I'll be focusing my talk on looking at the management practices that we have been up to in recent years on the properties where prairie chickens reside. Um, on, here we go. go. And so just an overview of what I'll be covering today. Um, first, I'd like to just go over some of the key wildlife areas that we manage that have prairie chickens on them and some of the differences between those properties. Um, and then just a, a brief 101 on what prairie chicken habitat needs are, since that is really on the basis for a large amount of our focus on what we, how we manage and when we manage. Um, and then follow up that with uh, much more details on the grassland management practices that we use, uh, giving you some ideas of some of the methods and objectives that we have for these practices and some stories on some successes and challenges that we've had over the years. So here's a map just showing the four key, key wildlife areas that we have where prairie chickens reside primarily. Uh, today I'm going to be focusing on three out of the four of them. So. The four that include the Mead Wildlife Area, they're up to the north, which I will not be focusing on today for, for talks. And then the three lower wildlife areas, the Paul Olson Wildlife Area, Buena Vista Wildlife Area, and the Leola Wildlife Area. Uh, the Wisconsin population is concentrated for prairie chickens on and around these four wildlife areas where our greatest grassland reserves exist for them. Um, all right. So to start off with, the Buena Vista Wildlife Area, which is our largest of the, the uh, three properties that I'll be talking about today. Uh, roughly, we have 12,700 acres uh, cons consisting of land that we both own and manage. Uh, we, we own most of it, um, roughly about 4,500 acres are owned by the Dane County Conservation League and a small parcel by the Wisconsin Society for Ornithology. And um, those properties are in long-term leases, so they're managed in the same way that we manage the lands that we own. The Buena Vista Wildlife Area, uh, this general area is in Glacial Lake, Wisconsin. It was a former Tamarack Swamp. And so the soils are, are loamy sand and muck overall. Um, the property itself or the, the vegetation that we have is primarily cool season grass stands. We are fortunate in this area to have some sandy knolls throughout the property. So there are some pretty decent stands of warm season grass and native forbs as well. The Paul J. Olson Wildlife Area, which is northwest of uh, Wisconsin Rapids, due west of Stevens Point, is a smaller property consisting of roughly 3,000 acres. 
Uh, the parcels range anywhere from 40 to 160 acres, and they're really widely scattered. So the Buena Vista Wildlife Area, the, the property is much more compact, and the property that we own is contiguous for the most part. The Paul Olson, the properties, as you can see in the map here, are much more spread out over two different counties. So there's some, some challenges with that. Um, the, the soils up there are more of a clay loam. And as you can see in the picture, if this gives you any, any indication, especially at this time of the year, we have a lot of challenges with dealing with wetland um, soils, standing water, access issues for management. Um, so there, there's different scenarios going on up there. We also have different vegetation. It is primarily cool season grass that we manage, but some of the habitat is also emergent wetland and wetland shrub habitat. The Loyola Wildlife Area is south of Wisconsin Rapids, southeast, and is roughly 1,860 acres. It's mostly cool season grasses as well, and also was formerly marsh, marsh habitat and had a, a lot of drainage ditches running through it, uh, similar to the Buena Vista Wildlife Area. So next I'll, I'll focus in here on some of the prairie chicken habitat needs that drive the types of management that we choose to focus on. So here's a slide that just uh, gives you an idea that prairie chickens are often the primary focus of our grassland conservation decisions on the properties they reside. And we refer to them as umbrella species uh, because protecting and managing them indirectly protects numerous other grassland species that we have. So this figure demonstrates this, you know, as you look along this continuum uh, on the far left, we've got lucking and booming habitat, which is very sparse and open. Um, and then as you scale over to the right, you've got more denser cover, taller vegetation, and then into nesting cover. Well, these are all very important um, components of habitat needs for prairie chickens throughout the year. And they fit the niche of a lot of different species that have specific requirements that fall within that very wide spectrum that prairie chickens have. And so by focusing on managing for them, we're in turn also helping with a numerous other suite of species that we have on the property. So luck habitat is um, the, usually the biggest focus in, the, in what we tend to look at when we are doing research or trying to focus on where to start our management. Luck habitat for prairie chickens is mostly short, very sparse vegetation, as you can see here in this picture. Uh, they like mostly very wide horizons so they can see uh, predators coming and see other chickens. Um, many of our leks tend to be on, um, it's about split equal equal on uh, public and private lands, but a lot of the leks on the private lands are on plowed fields. Uh, they're often under center pivot irrigation rigs on the Buena Vista wildlife area, um, or previously grazed areas or areas that we had hay cut the previous year. Uh, they also tend to be very close to permanent grass cover. Nesting habitat is another focus that we have. Um, typically nesting habitat, um, you know, hens will nest within about one to two miles from the lux that we have where they've been bred. Uh, nesting habitat tends to be more upland, a little bit drier. Um, it's kind of like a Goldilocks thing. They, they either want, they don't want too little or too much cover when it comes to nesting habitat. Um, you know, dense enough to conceal the hen sitting on the nest, but also a little bit sparse so that they can flush upward if needed if predators come in. Residual cover is really important as nesting begins before most of the vegetation is growing up, but too much, too much residual cover results in reduced nest survival, as we've found from some recent studies on the property. The presence of native grasses um, has not been shown to be as important. Um, it's more about the structure rather than the species type that we found. Uh, now, this is an interesting photo that I like to share with folks, just giving you an idea of where our leks and our, our nests are, are found on property. So this is based on a study that was done back in 2014 and 2015 on the Buena Vista wildlife area. And the, um, the take home here, if, if you look, we have the stars are showing the leks and the circles are nest locations. Now, the majority of the nest locations are, are, you know, are near a lek. And one thing to point out is that all the nest locations are on state owned or managed land. And that is why we place a real high priority on maintaining nesting habitat on the state land, 
since that is where that suitable nesting habitat is found on our, in, in these areas, is on the land that we are managing primarily. Brood habitat is another important consideration for us when we're doing our management. Um, it, it's in close proximity to um, the nesting habitat, but, but has sparser vegetation than nest habitat. Uh, forbs are important in brood habitat because they are directly uh, eaten as well as uh, having the ability to attract invertebrates, which are important for chicks early on in their lives. Um, recently disturbed habitat is usually the best habitat that we find for brood um, rearing habitat. And that's habitat that had been recently prescribed burned in a previous year or mowed, uh, grazed, as well as having uh, seeding done. Roosting habitat is not something we really take into too much consideration, um, but it is important and present. Um, you know, prairie chickens night roost, it's important in the winter. The roosts are usually on the ground. Um, we usually don't have any issues with having enough woody cover. Um, it's the other way around. So as I mentioned, it's not really a huge focus for us, but it is something to consider. Roosting habitat tends to be close to winter food sources and is um, something that we, we do consider from time to time. So now onto the grassland management practices that we have. Um, one thing that we always think about before really diving into what we're working on are our management sideboards. And um, this is always foremost on our mind when we're doing our work. So if you're not familiar, um, some of the sideboards that we have are with incidental take protocols for species. Uh, we fall under the grassland broad incidental take authorization, which basically uh, looks at the mortality of endangered and threatened species during habitat management on grassland property. So we have incidental take protocols for individual species on the properties that we manage, which limit the management amount and timing in order to reduce take of these species. Um, we have many species that have take protocols on our properties as listed here, um, prairie chicken, henslow, sparrow, loggerhead shrike, upland sandpiper, regal fritillary butterfly. Uh, for prairie chickens, the combined total amount of treatments cannot exceed 20% for any suitable nesting habitat that we have on each individual wildlife area. And um, this is during the nest um, avoidance period, which for prairie chickens uh, falls between May 10th and August 1st. And so we have to consider the grazing and burning, mowing and herbicide application that we do and the timing of those with all these different species to ensure we're following those protocols. So one example that I, that I share is on the Buena Vista wildlife area, roughly 12,600 acres are suitable nesting habitat at this point. 20% of that is roughly 2,600 acres. This year, we're already at roughly 17% of that nesting habitat being managed or being planned to be managed here soon, just under grazing alone. So that's something that, you know, it, it can be a challenge for us sometimes, but it's important to have those protocols in place. So prescribed burning is something that's pretty important for us on many of the properties, not all of them, but, um, you know, for example, the Buena Vista and Loyola wildlife areas, we do quite a bit of burning in the spring. And um, with this, typically on the Buena Vista wildlife area, it's our second most management tool when it comes to actual acres managed, uh, grazing being first at this point. Some of the objectives that we have for burning in the spring are to top kill brush, uh, to try to kill, uh, to kill, to remove that um, thatch, which is the dead residual grass that gets built up on the property. We also are looking to stimulate forbs and some of our warm season grass pockets that we have on the Buena Vista and to try to increase forb diversity and distribution. Um, following burns, we, we hope to try to look at doing some interseeding on some of these property to, to address some of the lower forb diversity that we have on our cool season grasslands. Um, some of the challenges that we have are the fact that because these are historically, you know, these were tamarack swamps, we're dealing with peat soils on the Leola and Buena Vista properties. And peat soil, you can't go too late into the spring and burn, otherwise you're going to have peat fires. So that does limit how late in the season we can burn, which, you know, for our warm season grasses, you tend to want to burn later in the, the spring than earlier. So there's kind of a balance there that we have and something that we have to consider. 
Um, so some of our future plans with burning that we, we plan on looking into are some small scale patch burn grazing efforts. It's not something we've done yet, um, but we hope to do within some of our rotational pastures uh, to focus cattle in specific areas um, to try to address some of our brush and herbaceous invasive issues. Um, we're hoping with this that we can create some different mosaics of vegetation and some patchy stands that we could then um, allow Forbes to have a better competition against some of the cool season grasses that we have out here and perhaps do some more interseeding. Now we also, we don't manage for enhancing forage on our property, but the side benefit of forage is that it, or of burning is that can, it can improve the forage quality and quantity as well for, for grazing, which is a benefit to our producers that are out there helping us manage the property. On the Buena Vista wildlife area, we roughly burn seven to 800 acres a year. And that's about the max that we've been doing the last couple of years. We also burn in the fall, um, as I'd mentioned on the Paulos and wildlife area, you know, we deal with a lot of um, issues with having wetter soils and burning in the spring really is not something that we've had any success with. So we, we tend to focus our burning from September to November on that property. Uh, some of the objectives are similar. We're looking to reduce thatch to top kill some brush. We also use it to do preparation for future management. So the picture that I have here is a burn that we did this fall, a 53 acre burn this last fall. Um, it was to do a, some site preparation to try to um, re remove or kill some of the brush that we have scattered out on the property to prep for a new organic pasture that we're gonna have. Um, and with organic grazing, we can't have the use of chemical for three years prior to introducing the livestock. So we can't use herbicide to control the brush. Um, so but by burning that allows us to, to get some jump on it and then we'll bring in livestock through this organic operation and have them go after the re-sprouts. So it gives us some more flexibility there in, in opportunities where we can't use chemical. Grazing, as I mentioned, is a really important management tool on several of our properties. Um, for Buena Vista, it is the number one most used management tool with regards to number of acres that are disturbed on the property each year right now. Um, on the Buena Vista, we have roughly 500 to 950 acres that are grazed each year using traditional grazing. That's the type of grazing where you just have one fenced in pasture and you put the livestock in and you leave them for a time period and they have freedom to go wherever they want within that fenced area. Um, typically our continuous grazing sites go for about one to two years. They tend to be smaller in size, closer to about 80 to 100 acres. And we run them from May through October. So uh, right now we're prepping to have livestock come in on the property this week and into next week. So um, some of the objectives that we have for our continuous grazing operations are to reduce that thatch and also to reduce um, brush um, through trampling and um, browsing to some extent uh, on some of the brush that we have. Uh, the preparation that we do on the properties, we typically go out the summer or fall prior to putting in the fence and um, we'll, we'll do some brush mowing as well as install the fencing. For most of our properties, we install all the fencing on our own. We're pretty efficient at doing that and have a lot of equipment um, at, our, at our fingertips to, to get the stuff in. Um, now stocking rates on these sites are dictated by the amount and the type of vegetation, the soil types that we have, and the specific, the specific objectives that we have for the site. Some of the benefits that we see from continuous grazing is that overall there's less cost involved. As I mentioned, we already have a lot of the fencing equipment. We can get up a 100 acre pasture in a matter of one day. Uh, with four or five staff. Um, so it's really low input on our end and it's low um, effort with regards to the producer as well. There's more interest because all they have to do is come in in the spring, put their livestock in and then let them go. We tend to use the sites for focusing on specific brush or invasive issues in one spot that we have. Some of the challenges that we have though with that is there can be a tendency to have overgrazing um, because we are not reducing the access to the pasture 
And so if we have a season where there tends to be droughty conditions, we sometimes have to destock or reduce the stock within some of these pastures. We also have challenges with erosion, as you can see here in this picture, uh, with some of our continuous sites that we're dealing with dug ponds for our water sources. And if you know anything about livestock, they tend to travel together. So when a couple of them head to the watering pond, they all go and you end up getting some of these travel lanes on the property, which can be you know, ripe areas for invasives to come in and we have to deal with trying to do interseeding um, after we've had livestock taken out of the, the pastures. And we also have some issues with things like Canada thistle coming in, as these are species that livestock tend to avoid consuming. The other type of grazing that we're doing, which is, um, it consists of the greatest amount of acreage that we have on our properties at this time, is managed rotational grazing. And we started this back in 2015 on both the, the Buena Vista and the Palo and wildlife areas. Um, these properties tend to be larger sites, and we have a lot more flexibility to adapt to some of the changing conditions. Um, on, on Buena Vista, we have uh, this year roughly 1,480 acres in these rotational sites with four pastures. On the Powell Wilson, there's 315 acres with five pastures going right now. And with Leola, we have a 450 acre pasture. Um, what's really great about these types of pastures as we have more flexibility as I mentioned, we can focus livestock in specific areas. We can change the stocking rates throughout the season as they need to adapt to changes in vegetation. And um, we, we typically fall into the range of what's considered conservation grazing for these. So we have less intensive forms of management to maintain and increase diversity. Uh, we do some practiced targeting grazing too, where we wanna more intensely manage some things such as invasives in specific areas. Uh, so some of the objectives that we have for these types of pastures are to enhance our forb and grass diversity, to set back aspen and willow, uh, reduce select invasive species, and then overall just try to reduce the amount of mechanical and chemical that we're putting out there. It, it helps us by saving us time and money and reducing the amount of chemical that we're putting out on the property. So here's a, a photo basically showing one of our more recent rotational pastures that we're putting in this year on the Buena Vista wildlife area, just to give you an idea of kind of the layout for our systems. So with rotational pastures, we have our perimeter fence, but within there, we have pasture being broken up into smaller fence paddocks. So we've got our center wire, which is permanent, going down the center of it right there. And then in the yellow lines, that's what our, our poly reel or temper, temporary wire is. And those are extended out using step-in fence posts and poly wire. We can change the size of the paddocks and the locations of them as we want to throughout the year to adapt to changes in vegetation. And it can also allow us to change the stocking rate by making the pastures either larger or smaller. In this pasture that we have here, we also have established a refuge. And by having that poly wire, we can determine where those refuges are and change them if need be. Uh, most of our rotational pastures are five-year contracts. We need to do larger contracts for these because there's a lot more effort involved on behalf of the producer. And um, with all the work that we ask them to do with rotational grazing, we, well, we try to have a longer contract to address some of the management objectives that we have. Uh, we have extensive grazing management plans for each one of these sites. And in those plans, we lay out the objectives that we have for the property, the site history. Uh, we go through some of the current conditions that we have, like the, the soil and the invasives that are present. With all of our pastures now, we're also collecting soil samples prior to introducing livestock to see how the soil changes over time. Uh, we lay out the details for how we're gonna establish the infrastructure and the grazing regime, such as the livestock type, paddock sizes, our rotation intervals, the number of gra grazing days and where the refuges are gonna be for wildlife. Um, we also lay out the responsibilities. So with these contracts, we ask a lot of our producers. Um, some of them require daily or every other day moves of their livestock. So they're out there all the time moving their cattle. Um, we also do in-kind services where we ask producers to do interseeding for us or mowing of brush as well. 
And very important, we have a contingency plan that's listed in each one of the plans to address anything that would happen, such as a drought condition where we would have to destock or reduce stocking rates. Um, so as I had indicated earlier, we do pretty much all of our fence in infrastructure installation on our properties. Um, we have all the equipment. Uh, occasionally, we will use contractors for digging in uh, ponds, but most of the time we, we have everything set up for us. We have tractors with attachments to spool wire for removal, uh, UTVs with spinning jenny attachments to lay out the high tensile wire, post hole loggers, um, and post, power post drivers as well. Um, so as I mentioned, most of the work is now just um, pond construction for contractors. Some of the challenges that we have are providing water in some locations on the Paulus and wildlife area is a great example. Uh, wells cost too much um, up on some of these properties that we have, and we have to go through an extensive, uh, an extensive pond permitting process as well, um, considering things like county non-metallic mining ordinances and permits and, and the such. Organic grazing is another consideration and there's some benefits, but also challenges with that as well. Uh, we have two organic pasture producers on the Paulus and wildlife area. And some of the considerations we have are some of those um, obvious ones like herbicide use restrictions. So we have to plan well in advance. We need to know three years before livestock come in that we're gonna do this so that we halt all use of herbicide on the parcel. Uh, we also have to look at the fencing infrastructure because it is different for organic, such as using non-treated post um, is one example. We also have to consider uh, setbacks where we put the fencing to stay away from adjoining landowners that might be spraying chemical on their properties. Uh, some of the specific things that we do with uh, rotational grazing are focusing in on brush reduction. So here we've got some, some photos showing you of some of the work that we, we can do. So cattle don't typically eat woody vegetation, but they do wonders with trampling it. Um, they will browse the leaves of young plants, um, especially, you know, the new ones. And, but mostly what they do is physical damage. They do it by rubbing up against the brush or if it's small enough by trampling it. Um, so we, here we have some pictures on the upper left photo is a picture of black locust that they're rubbing up against on a property. And the lower right photo is some aspen that we've got that you can see a clear rub line for. Uh, we did have some research from UW-Madison come out here recently um, from Laura Judge in Agroeconomy that looked at grazing and mowing and grazing and the use of spraying and grazing and, and control sites on the Buena Vista wildlife area. And she had found that cattle alone did reduce large aspen stands on some of the parcels, um, mainly because of physical damage. Um, there was some browse on smaller aspen but not really consistent for other species that we have like spirea and willow. Um, she did find ultimately that the combination of herbicide and grazing was the most reliable for reducing uh, brush and that is something that we do. So another example that we have is reducing invasives using livestock. Um, Canada goldenrod is one, it's the most common forb species that we have on Buena Vista wildlife area. Although it's native, it's very aggressive. In the fall, it looks like a packer's field. It's just yellow and green on some of these pastures that we have. So um, Laura Judge also looked at that too. And she, she did find that goldenrod was less abundant in grazed areas, although it wasn't significant. So it shows some promise of using a combination of herbicide and grazing to control goldenrod. Um, sometimes cattle can be trained to eat invasives too. Uh, we had a, a producer a couple of years ago on the Buena Vista look at um, a concoction of a, a molasses mix that he'd pour on spotted knapweed. And uh, he was able to get his livestock to focus in on those areas and consume some of the knapweed. Uh, for grass and forbs, um, Laura Judge also looked at that and did not find any increase in forbs on the Buena Vista wildlife area. Uh, she had found that forb diversity really only increased in areas where forbs were initially present. So that's something that we're trying to consider in the future are ways that we can intercede forbs and use livestock um, to help us with that. For example, having them tightly grazed down in the fall so that we can have a, a lower uh, grass height to help us get in there and do some interceding. 
Mowing is another one that we use quite a bit, um, particularly for our brush control. Uh, we typically contract out this work. We'll sometimes we'll use um, DNR uh, FECON machines as well. And the objectives are, are to slow some of that woody brush succession that we have. Um, we'll also mow to maintain lex and to do some control of species like goldenrod. Um, challenges that we have is it's our most costly practice. So it does eat up quite a bit of money to hire a contractor to go in and do some of this brush control. And the other follow up is that we have to go in and do usually more mowing or herbicide to control the brush resprouts that come in. Uh, here's just a couple of photos that we've got of some before and after work that we've done with some fee conning on the Paulson wildlife area. Uh, hand cutting is another tool that we use and we, we take in um, great advantage of having some young eager students come out. Um, the UW Stevens Point chapter of the Wildlife Society not too long ago back in 2017 adopted the Buena Vista wildlife area and they help us out a lot, a lot in this realm. So they go out with chainsaws and brush trimmers on weekends and get a lot of the, the larger brush or brush that we can't access with some of our equipment and really help us out that way. Uh, herbicide application, as I mentioned, we use in, in a lot of different ways. Um, we, we broadcast it with tractors and boom sprayers. Uh, we hand spray with um, just hand sprayers for smaller areas. And we will also use aerial in sites where we can't access some of our larger equipment. Our objectives mostly are controlling woody species and herbaceous invasive species. Um, biocontrol has been used um, very minimally. Uh, we have it on the Paulson wildlife area for control of some small areas of purple loosestrife. It has been shown to limit the spread of loosestrife and um, we've got some dedicated volunteers that do that for us as we would not have the time to do it ourselves. To some extent, only very limited, we have some row crop farming that we use to help um, for prepping areas for future um, conversion into better, more suitable habitat and grassland. We'll target small areas where we have a lot of chronic issues with undesirable species. And um, typically we'll do a rotation of corn into cool season grass with an oak cover crop and then follow that up with some hay harvest um, as in kind. So we have the farmers do all the work and in turn they can harvest hay at the, the end of this. Uh, we have some hay harvest that is also done on some of the properties. We, we try to take advantage of this and we'll have farmers mow our leks for us. And then in turn, they get the grass without having to have any money exchanged. Um, so we, we mostly work on in-kind agreements with regards to our hay harvest. Uh, we also more recently have focused on some dove food plots um, on the Buena Vista Wildlife Area, where we have rotation of wheat and sunflower. Um, our primary, primary objective is to do this for dove hunting opportunities, but um, prairie chickens and other wildlife benefit as a result. Um, in our sunflower fields, we've been seeing a lot of sign of prairie chickens. And as I had mentioned earlier too, this is something we're looking at just um, getting into. We've done it a little bit, but we're trying to focus more on increasing this effort on trying to do some interseeding of our cool season grasslands to enhance the forb diversity, um, primarily for having some pollinator habitat and then having those forbs to provide uh, invertebrates for the prairie chickens, as well as just having invertebrates present on the property. Um, we're looking at getting basically very persistent, relatively cheap forbs, as it can be a real challenge to try to get forbs to go on cool season grasslands that can be very aggressive. Uh, so we're looking at you know, black, black eyed Susan, yellow coneflower, bergamot, those types of species, and then trying to find areas where we can get some interseeding done, um, such as having some combination of grazing, burning, and mowing, um, possibly also some patch burn grazing. And we'll need to see it at higher, higher rates and do this um, in coordination with a lot of disturbance um, over the years following the interseeding, but it is possible. Uh, this is a photo on the Paulus and wildlife area of a site that is all cool season grass, but we were able to get some forbs to come in and I think it looks great now. Um, so that's, that's something that we're working to do. Um, 
One final thing that we do focus on to some extent when we have the time and the funding is some wetland habitat restoration too, as that is consistent with the open habitat that we want to provide for prairie chickens. So we do some installation of scrapes and burns and do some seedings using NACA grants and wetland stamp projects. And those have been very successful. We have sites where we have um, waterfowl and chickens nesting on the same, same adjoining upland habitat. So um, great success there too. All right, well, I'll wrap up that and I, I guess maybe we'll save questions till after Elena's done. Yep, we'll okay. save questions till after Elena's done. Great. So thank you, Lisa. Yeah, no problem. And now we're going to have Elena Garretts, um, who is the is Assistant Upland Wildlife Ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR. She grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, earned her bachelor's degree in wildlife ecology from UWSP then worked various technician jobs across the country until starting her master's program at Louisiana State University, researching wild turkey movement ecology and turkey hunter interactions. She has worked for the Wisconsin DNR in this position just under two years now. Today, she'll describe the history of Greater Prairie Chicken Management Plan, its current status, components of the plans, tips on how to get involved in the planning process and steps moving forward. I'm having difficulty accessing my screen to stop sharing. Um, Got you covered. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Yep. No. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I think I might actually turn my video off just so that I don't um, go over my bandwidth limits here. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So yes, my name is Elena Garretts. I am the Assistant Upland Wildlife Ecologist for DNR. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about the Prairie Chicken Management Plan draft that we have underway. I'm hoping to have it approved before this year is up. So it'll be a plan that goes through 2031. I'm gonna be talking today about why we create management plans, what they're used for. And then I'm gonna specifically talk about Prairie Chicken Management Plan, um, the current threats to greater prairie chickens, which is going to really set the stage for the rest of my talk where we talk about our components of the plan and our objectives and things like that. Um, having Lisa go first with that awesome presentation helps a ton um, because it explains a lot of their needs for habitat and obviously that's the basis of this plan. Then I'm gonna talk about the management alternatives within this plan. Um, this document is unique in that typically when we put out a management plan for a species, we create a first draft with our advisory committee, which consists of external stakeholders, and then we'll go forward to the public with this draft of a plan talking about objectives that we have going forward, and then we'll get public comment um, and take those comments and tweak the plan so that it fits all of our needs. This one is a little bit different because it has a suite of management options, basically. There's four alternatives that have varying levels of resources required to fulfill them um, attached to different expected outcomes that we'll see. So we're going to go forward to the public with a first draft of management alternatives and we're gonna ask the public basically to choose an option. Um, and once we do have a final plan, our final alternative will probably be some type of hybrid of these first four options that we're gonna be presenting. Um, and I'll get more into that later. Then I'm gonna talk about the research priorities that we have included in this draft plan. And finally, I'm going to touch on how you can participate in the planning process, how you can get your voice heard, and a rough timeline of what our steps moving forward are gonna be for getting this plan approved and implemented. So what is the purpose of a wildlife species management plan in the first place? Um, it's not uncommon for us to have management plans on a species basis. We have them for most of our game animals. And this is also a unique species in that it's sort of a team effort being managed by both the Bureau of Wildlife Management, which I'm housed under, Lisa is housed under, and the Bureau of Natural Heritage Conservation, which are our folks who work on things like state threatened species, which the greater prairie chickens are in Wisconsin. 
These plans are a framework and structure to provide long-term recommendations on things like population management, habitat management, and prescriptions. It also outlines um, education and outreach efforts, research priorities for the future. Not only does it give us objectives that we can check off as we complete them, but it also provides us a basis for introducing new initiatives or new programs that don't yet exist. It gives us a basis or basically something to stand on to implement those new efforts. These plans are typically developed by internal staff and by advisory committees um, who are made of external stakeholders that have interest or influence on um, the species itself. All plans go through a public review process, which I touched on briefly. Um, we just wanna make sure that we're getting the public's voice heard and their concerns addressed. And this is a special species too, in that it exists in one central location in the state. So our neighbors who border those properties that Lisa was talking about um, and all of the different land use practices they use, it's important for us to understand their land use practices and how we're impacting them with our management and vice versa. All plans have to be approved by the Natural Resources Board before they're implemented. These plans are revisited periodically to um, make sure we're checking our progress on our ob objectives, but also to incorporate any kind of new research that may have popped up or new data needs that we didn't know existed um, at the time of implementation of the plan. They utilize and they advance science. So when we're drafting the document, we are trying to pull from the most recent research that we can. Um, and also it prompts future research. And, and I'll get into that when I talk about the research priorities. It identifies threats to the species, um, both past, current and future threats and how we can mitigate them. And um, other things like you know climate change that might be on the horizon and we don't know exactly how it's going to affect them, but know it's something we need to um, be serious about in the next 10 years of the plan. We try to always employ a strategic management approach, which is um, basically just getting the best return on your investment. So where can we prioritize all of our key actions or initiatives in both time and space to, um, again, get the most return on your investment or bang for your buck. I hate to say that cliche, but it actually does work. <laughs> um, again, like I said, we need to engage the public and stakeholders. This is this can't be just an internal thing, especially with a species like the prairie chicken that are so very area sensitive. Um, we can't simply just manage our state lands and expect the species to proliferate. Um, it goes a, a, a lot farther beyond our our state boundaries. And of course, uh, maximize public value because all wildlife species are owned by the public. So these are the four properties that Lisa was talking about that we have chickens. Those are outlined in red. And then the greater border that shows all of the green and yellow colors uh, represents the central Wisconsin grassland conservation area. This is a project boundary that we're using as a basis for this plan. Um, and also it will help me explain the next couple of slides. Um, our folks in the Office of Applied Science, Ivy Wittick and Chris Palantir put together a land cover analysis that looked at how land use changes have um, shifted in the last couple of decades, specifically within the CWGCA. So they took data from Wiskland 1, which shows different habitat types from 91 to 93, and then compared the change in land uses to 2010 through 2014. So this is pretty pretty recent data. Um, and this shows percentage of, of change in habitat type. So you'll see that line straight down the center at zero. Everything left of center is going to indicate um, a decrease in, uh, in habitat percentage over that those two time periods. And then everything to the right is gonna represent an increase in that habitat type. So as you can see, looking at this uh, graphic, there was a large decrease in non-row agriculture. So things like small grains and cereal crops have decreased pretty dramatically. Grassland has decreased and then also um, more to a minor extent, but certain types of wetlands have decreased too. Um, so even though places like our state owned properties um, that Lisa was talking about have actually increased in amount of grassland cover and management in the last couple of years. 
overall within that whole project boundary that spans multiple counties, those types of habitats have decreased. And on top of that decrease, we've seen an increase in really inhospitable habitat types, which include forest cover and cropland, which means traditional row crop agriculture, which unfortunately is just really not, um, not hospitable to prairie chickens. So the reason that I shared that quick tidbit with that land cover analysis is because that really formed the basis for um, our internal team that went forward and drafted this plan and specifically the management alternatives. Those are our biggest threats to prairie chickens right now is the loss in habitat and the, the land cover, like land use um, changes at, at a landscape scale have been pretty dramatic. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about the components of the plan. Um, it's pretty typical in, in most of these to talk about the biology and the natural history, which Lisa did touch on a little bit. Um, it just introduces you to the species and what they need because before you can set that stage, you can't really get into how you're going to fix it or how you're going to make it better. The next part of the plan talks about threats to the prairie chicken, which I briefly touched on here, that landscape level land use change that we've seen in central Wisconsin, we believe is the biggest threat to prairie chickens right now um, that land use changes have led to habitat loss and degradation for prairie chickens. The next part of the plan is a summary of the, the last plan, which um, finished out in 2014. This process has been a little, um, I don't know what the correct word is for it. It's been a little, um, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm at a loss. <laughs> It, it's been put on hold by the previous administration and now the new administration has asked us to pick it back up. So it's something that was underway in 2017. Um, a large portion of the plan was created and drafted and then we were asked to set it aside at that point. So now in the last year or so, an internal team of folks have gotten back together and started drafting that plan with basically completely revised sideboards as far as what our key actions and our goals could be, what tools we could put in our toolbox has really changed a lot. Um, the next section of the plan talks about current management, so all the stuff that Lisa talked about, um, monitoring and surveys, recent research. Then we talk briefly about research priorities we have for the future, so what gaps in knowledge are existing and how we can fill them to even better our management and better our strategic ap approach to implementing these things. And then the meat of the plan, what has changed the most in this version is the management alternatives, which are those four options that we're gonna present to the public with varying levels of resources and details and key actions um, with varying expected outcomes just to gauge the public's interest in the species and what level of resources um, the DNR needs to commit to them in the future. And we are still working with our advisory committee on drafting that first version of the management alternative. So unfortunately, I don't have um, exact details on those. I'll talk about them more in a couple minutes here, but I don't have exact details on what's going to be added in each one because we're still in a working draft phase right now. Um, once we have that, we'll go to the public, we'll get their comment, ask them which alternative they choose best or which one they feel fits best. And then we'll create some sort of hybrid alternative um, that'll probably include different pieces of a bunch of different alternatives that is going to suit us the best going forward. So these management alternatives that I've been talking about, um, they are based on the best available science that we have, uh, the most recent research that's applicable to us, including the land cover analysis that I very, very briefly touched on. There's a lot more in-depth information in the draft of the plan on that. Uh, that set the stage for, for what, what things we need to include in this plan. Um, it's also based on the fact that grassland management on our state-owned properties has increased um, quite considerably in the last couple of years, so that's something that we're taking into consideration. Again, we want to employ that strategic focus. Uh, there's been a lot of research that's shown that um, as much work as you can do as close to the lex site as possible is the best because a lot of their life cycle activities are focused around that lex site. As Lisa said, um, nests and brooding sites are typically not more than a couple of miles away from the lex site. 
And since this is such an area sensitive species, we need to really bolster and work on uh, public and private partnerships and collaborating with not only private landowners, but also NGOs, other partners that can help us find creative funding solutions and um, practices to use to get more quality grassland habitat on the species or on the landscape, I'm sorry. Um, Prairie chickens, even though they may never travel more than a couple of miles away from the lex site in their whole lifetime, as a population, they need to have truly tens of thousands of acres of contiguous grassland habitat to really thrive and propagate, um, which is something we just haven't seen too much lately in central Wisconsin because of the increase in development and traditional row crop agriculture. So we need to partner up and we need to reach beyond our, our state-owned properties to really bring this species into, a, into the future. And on that same note, we, we're gonna have to rely very heavily on stakeholder and public input because we need to manage um, a lot of private lands around uh, those properties and um, work with people as much as we can. So the suite of alternatives that I've been referencing um, there right now, the way that the draft stands, there's four alternatives. They're not finalized yet. So I, I wish I could have went through one, two, three, four with you guys and really fleshed each one out, but they're not quite there yet. Um, we have an advisory committee meeting coming up in a couple weeks, and I'm really hoping that at the end of that, we can walk away with the first draft that's going to be ready to present to the public. But Basically, we have these alternatives, one through four, with one being um, the most resource heavy, so requiring the most, the highest level of funding, the, the highest number of key actions, um, the highest acreage goals for core habitat and private lands initiatives, and then every alternative that follows has less and less resources required, um, less and less acreage goals, and with um, the fourth being the least amount of resources required. And we, we need to get the public's input on all of these alternatives and where we should fall because we're probably not gonna be able to do our Cadillac alternative, but also we don't probably want to do the most drastic alternative um, either. So. Within those alternatives, there's a varying level of key actions, like I said, and those things include private lanes initiatives. So incentivizing NRCS programs like uh, the Conservation Reserve programs, CREP, other NRCS programs that are going to incentivize producers to set aside um, marginal crop lands and put them back into grass. Um, and especially want to focus on those areas closest to the properties where the chickens are exist right now. Other key actions include grass bank and set aside programs. So that would be incentivizing uh, grass based producers to rest their lands and then come onto DNR lands and graze their cattle so that we're, we have more of that uh, rotational grazing going on, um, healthier grass on, on both areas, both the private lands and our areas. The plan also calls for increases in habitat management on our own public lands, so even going above and beyond what Lisa already talked about and, and trying to commit some more staff time and that sort of thing to increasing the habitat management we do in our lands. And then on top of that, increased permanent land protections, so acquisition and easements. The more land we can acquire, the more we can set it aside and put it back into grass is going to be obviously very beneficial to us. And then um, conservation grazing programs, so getting producers involved in conservation-minded um, grass-based agricultural practices. Those are a few examples of our key actions included within this draft. Uh, research priorities that are included in the plan, um, places where we feel like we have gaps in knowledge. Uh, habitat management, although we've been doing grassland management on our state-owned lands for decades, we'd like to do more research to see exactly what prescriptions we should be um, adding. Like Lisa talked about doing some type of patch burn grazing scheme. What's the best prescription for that or formula? How many acres do you burn? How often do you graze it? How often are you rotating those strategies? Um, more more prescriptive um, plans is gonna is gonna better us and, and looking at that and seeing what the pros and cons of each are, especially considering that prairie chickens have such a wide range of um, life history needs from really, really short grass for lecking to taller, thicker grass for nesting and that sort of thing. 
Um, climate change is also something that's very much on our radar. And I, I would say that this is something that comes up in a lot of species management plans because it's affecting um, the ranges of the habitats that these species rely on, but also their ranges as well. So that's something we need to keep an eye out in the future. And there's others um, that are being discussed and formulated by the advisory committee right now. So how can you guys participate in this planning process? Um, like I said, I don't have any dates for you quite yet, but once we do have our public um, comment period open and the first draft is finished, we'll be having a live Zoom meeting where you can come on and I'll give a presentation about the mechanics of the plan typically or uh, most likely I'll be really focusing on those management alternatives and how they differ. Um, and then there'll be a question and answer session at the end of that meeting. Once the plan is put is drafted, we'll put it on our website where you can review the whole thing. And then once the public comment period opens, you can feel free to submit comments via email, uh, phone call works as well. And like I said, this plan is a little different and a little bit, um, I guess, more unique in that we would like you to really focus, especially in those management alternatives and which you prefer and why um, and what we may be missing also from our alternatives. Steps moving forward, um, the committee is going to meet in a couple of weeks to hopefully complete this first draft that'll be open for public review. Then we'll have a month long comment period. We'll have that Zoom meeting I talked about um, after that, I'll compile all of our public comments. We'll go back to the advisory committee and talk about all of the comments. And from there, we're going to edit and revise and figure out how our final alternative or chosen management plan for the future is gonna look like. And as I've stated a couple times before, it's likely gonna be some kind of hybrid or mixture of the four alternatives that will be presented in the first draft. And then once we have that final plan, we'll, we'll bring it to our wildlife leadership team for their approval. And then we will eventually present it to the Natural Resources Board for a statewide approval. So that's all I have. Stop sharing my screen here. Thank you, Elena. Um, so it looks Thank like- you. A lot of the questions that we've had have already been answered in the chat so far. Um, feel free everybody to put any more questions you have in the chat. Otherwise I believe there's a raise your hand option and we'd be able to unmute you. Um, I just wanna thank you everyone for participating in today's Brown Bag webinar. Um, these are the second Wednesday of each month at noon. And so next month on June 9th, we'll have Bob Hansen and Brian Haringa presenting about the Northwest Sands ecosystem. Um, so with that, does anybody have any questions for Lisa or Elena? Looks like Teresa is looking for the link to the plan again um, to share that. And I just wanna let everybody know too, we do record these webinars and they are available on the Wisconsin chapter of the Wildlife Society's YouTube channel. So I, there's a link to that earlier in the chat as well. Yep, so I'll say that the, the draft of the plan is not posted on the website yet. Um, like I said, it's not quite complete, but I will post a link to the Prairie Chicken Management webpage where you'll be able to find it in the future. Um, Tom Haugie has a question for Lisa. What do you wish you could do more of? What is needed to allow you to do so? Yeah, great question, Tom. Um, you know, you think that for me, it would be a focus on state land, but, but honestly, if I could do more of, I would want to be able to do more private lands work and create and help foster those partnerships. I mean, obviously the DNR, we've we found over time should take a, more of a, a role that's 
in the background and to encourage other partners to push forward uh, with a lot of our objectives. But I, I really wish that I could help um, in, enhance those partnerships and get more funding for them so we can focus on projects such as you know, creating wildlife habitat, grassland habitat near our properties on private lands, um, having more funding and incentives for those landowners so that they're willing to put in permanent cover and do that type of work so we can expand the habitat beyond the state lands. That's what I wish I could do more of. And then we have another question from Ali Scott. What is the one thing you wish the public knew or understood about prairie chickens? And are there any big misconceptions? Well, I, I think overall, I, I know locally anyway, from what we found over time and with surveys and public outreach is there are a lot of misconceptions within the agricultural community on the value of having grasslands and the presence of prairie chickens. Um, there's a lot of concerns that government will come in and direct them on how to manage their land or the viewpoint that grassland habitat on public land is wasted land that should be farmed and is full of weeds. Um, I, I wish that the public would better understand all the benefits that our grasslands provide to us beyond just providing habitat for prairie chickens. Um, you know, we focus so much on chickens because they're, they're the umbrella species, but we have a suite of other species that need protection, plus everything else that grasslands bring to us. I mean, the hunting and trapping opportunities, the hiking, bird watching, um, you know, being able to have those intangible values that grasslands provide that we all take for granted, like uh, the quality of our water and our soil. So um, I, I really wish that the public would more, more fully embrace and understand those benefits. Elena, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think Lisa covered that really well. Um, the only thing I would add to is that we're trying to shift more towards a working lands approach too. So just because you have a farm doesn't mean that you can't be void of wildlife or um, grassland habitat. There's certain programs um, like with Pheasants Forever called uh, Precision Agriculture where they can look at parts of your fields that may be extra wet or um, aren't providing return on your investment with seeding them, you're actually losing money. Um, so there's there's still things you can do and have a working farm and, and be creating wildlife habitat at the same time. Yeah, great, Elena. Um, you know, one of the things we had talked about in the past is a grass bank program where we could perhaps have producers graze on state lands and rest their pastures in turn. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Well, we're a couple minutes past the hour. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Lisa and Elena for giving your presentations. My pleasure. Thank you.